Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah. Chapter number 42, Do not set up rivals unto Allah. <coughs> Bismillah, inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'ghfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina. Man yahdihi allahu falamudilla lah, wa man yudzilhu falahadiya lah. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. Amma ba'd. Um, in this chapter, where it's basically a continuation of the previous chapter, is that part of setting up rivals with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to acknowledge or to claim that other than Allah gave you your blessings. In other words, when Allah gives you blessings, instead of thanking Allah, you mention or you thank other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's a continuation of the previous chapter that obviously the verse also refers to the mushrikun. It refers to setting up physical idols and deities besides God. But also many Muslims might fall into it when they uh, attribute some good to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the interpretation of Ibn Abbas will show. Naam. Allah the Almighty said, Do not set up rivals unto Allah while you know that He alone has a right to be worshipped. With the reference to the above quoted verse, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said, Al-Andad means shirk. It is... In, inconspicuous as a black ant moving on a black stone in the darkness of the night. It is to swear by Allah and by your life and by my life. It is also to, to say, had there not been this little dog or the duck in the house, the thief would have entered. Or like the statement of a man to his companion, by Allah and yours will. Or had it not been Allah and so and so. Do not mention anybody with Allah because all of it is shirk. Now Ibn Abbas is interpreting this verse. Obviously we said that this verse also applies to the mushrikun, but this is a principle that we use in tafsir is that, um, that the verse, if it has more than one meaning and there's no contradiction in those meanings, we'll carry it upon all of those meanings. Okay? And this is part of the miraculous nature of the Qur'an, that the Qur'an has many shades of meanings to it. In the sense that this verse applies to the mushrikun, right? That obviously don't take andad besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't take partners besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah. But this also applies to some types of Muslims that attribute any good or um, the prevention of evil to other than Allah. So Ibn Abbas said, andad is shirk. Okay? And it is more hidden than a, an ant crawling on a black stone in the middle of the night. And we mentioned this ethel before. And Ibn Abbas also said this about other types of shirk. That it is, they are more hidden than a black um, than an ant crawling on a black stone in the middle of a black night. And for, he gave some examples. It is to say, I swear by Allah and by your life. So because to swear by other than Allah is a type of shirk. Okay? And it is to say, I swear by my own life. Okay? Whereas, how did the Prophet ﷺ used to swear? He used to swear, I swear by him in whose hands is my life. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But to say, I swear by my life, this is a type of shirk. Also it is to say, and he's giving examples here, excuse me, he's not just talking about the, uh, the only interpretation of the verse, he's just giving you some examples so that you understand. And another example is that you say, were it not for this dog, then we would have been attacked by the thief. Okay? So in other words, you are, you are ascribing to this dog the capability of protecting you, whereas it was actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who protected you. Likewise, were it not for this animal or this duck in the house, then the thief would have been able to uh, attack us. And another example he said is to say, Whatever Allah wills and you will. So for example, you go to a person and you ask him for something. Okay? And then you say, whatever Allah wills and you will, I will be satisfied with that. It's as if you have made him a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, setting him, setting him up to the level of Allah. That whatever Allah wills and you will, then I'll, I'll take that. Okay? Whereas the proper way to say it, and we're going to come to this later on, is to say whatever Allah wills and then whatever you will. So to make sure that it's clear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater than and there is no comparison with him and the other person. Likewise, it is a statement of the, of the man, were it not for Allah and so and so. So for example, you say, were it not for Allah and the, the cop and the policeman, then this and this would have happened to me. So it's as if you have set up a rival with Allah, even though you don't mean to say that the policeman is Allah, you're not, you're not trying to equate them. But the way that you phrased it, it could lead to minor shirk. Okay? The way that you phrased it, it is not a proper way of phrasing it. Were it, not, uh, were it not for Allah and the, and the policeman, then we would have been robbed. This is a, uh, it's, a, it's leading to minor shirk. Because your phrasing has the sense that it is as if you are making this policeman or this person equivalent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Ibn Abbas said, don't put the other man in it. Don't put the other man in this statement. Just say, were it not for Allah. If you say, were it not for Allah and the man, this is a type of shirk. Okay? In the sense that this is going to lead you uh, to minor shirk. Naam. 
Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu narrated that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Whoever swears rather than Allah has disbelieved or committed shirk. Okay, now this is a very explicit uh, hadith concerning swearing by other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you are not allowed to swear, to give an oath, except with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name mentioned in it. Or obviously one of his attributes, okay? Either Allah's names or his attributes, that's it. You cannot even swear by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You cannot swear by the Kaaba. You cannot swear by the Quran. Uh, well, the Quran is different, sorry. You can't swear by the Quran because it's actually Allah. You cannot swear by uh, the Mus'haf, for example. The, the paper of the Quran. You cannot swear by that. Okay? So you cannot swear by anything that is created. Anything that is created. Whoever does so, he has committed kufr or shirk. If you swear by other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala... If you swear by, even so many people they swear by their mother, I swear by my mother, I swear by my father, I swear by myself, by my own life. All of this is a type of shirk. You can only give an oath with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name with it, or his attributes, that's it. Whoever swears by other than Allah or his names and attributes, he has committed a type of shirk. This is because when you swear by something, then you have exalted it to a great level. That you are trying to make the other person believe you. So you're going to use the name of an object that is holy or sacred to you. So if you were to swear by any object that is created, it is as if you are claiming that this created object has a great importance to you. Yet there is nothing that is uh, more worthy of respect and importance and worship than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you cannot swear by any other name except if it is Allah's names or attributes. If you do so, then you have exalted that thing, if you have exalted that attribute, so that it is as if you are making it a deity besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you swear by other than Allah, uh, then you uh, accidentally, then you should... Uh, um, Make an explanation for that by basically saying La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika and other such phrases as that. You should say something that affirms the uh, the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be worshipped. Naam. Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu anhu said, To swear by Allah while lying is more loved by me than to swear by other than him while speaking truth. Now this is a very interesting narration. Ibn Masood is saying, If I give an oath with Allah, while I am lying. So, if, for example, uh, someone, you know, st- steals, okay? Someone comes and asks him, did you steal this thing? He'll say, I swear by Allah, I didn't steal. This is a lie. He stole. Not only is a lie a major sin, he is swearing by Allah. And when you swear by Allah, then obviously the sin will be magnified even more. Because you're making, you're making a vain oath in Allah's name. So, Ibn Mas'ud is saying, if I were to swear by Allah, as a liar then I prefer this than to swear by other than Allah and I'm truthful. Do you understand this? So he'll say, for example, for example, suppose the person did not steal. He says, I swear by my mother I did not steal. Okay? Ibn Mas'ud is saying, if I were to lie using Allah's name, it is more beloved to me than to tell the truth using other than Allah's name. Can anyone explain to me why? The shirk is the greatest sin. Exactly. When he is lying by Allah's name, is he committing any shirk? No, he is committing a major, major, major sin. But it's not shirk. Lying in and of itself is a major sin. You add to that lie an oath by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it magnifies the sin. But if you tell the truth, and you tell it in other than Allah's name, you swear and give an oath by other than Allah, then that is minor shirk, and it could lead to major shirk. And minor shirk is greater than the greatest major sin. Realize this, minor shirk, When we call it minor, don't think it's small thing, trivial. No, it's just minor in comparison to major. But minor shirk is a greater sin than the most major of the major sins. Okay? So minor shirk, because Ibn Mas'ud realized this, and this is a very important narration, it shows you, forget about the the concept of oath, it shows you that minor shirk is a greater sin than any major sin. That's why Ibn Mas'ud is saying that if I were to give a lie, if I were to tell a lie swearing by Allah, I'd rather do this than to tell the truth swearing by other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So look at the iman of Ibn Mas'ud. Look at how he realizes what aqidah and tawheed is. Look at how he appreciates and understands the importance of tawheed. That he realizes that if, even if to swear by other than Allah is a type of shirk. So he says, if I were to lie with Allah's name, I would prefer that than to tell the truth using other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Naam. Hudayfa radiallahu anhu narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Do not say with the will of Allah and with the will of that person, but rather say with the will of Allah and then with the will of that person. Okay, once again, the 
concept going back to equating something with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? Suppose, uh, you know, you're under the uh, favor of a person, you know, uh, you know, your boss or whatever, he's going to give you a raise at the end of the year, okay? So, you're saying, you're talking to another person and you say, you know, uh, well, with the will of Allah and the will of my boss and the will of my boss, I'm going to get a raise next year. Well, it's as if you have equated your boss with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet is saying, don't say with, uh, by the will of Allah and the will of so and so. Because it's as if you're equating him and there is no equation. Actually, it's only by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might use people, He might use certain means that will, uh, you know, give you your, uh, what you're looking for. So rather the proper way to phrase such statements is by the will of Allah and then by the will of so and so. So you're making it a clear distinction. Allah is greater and superior to, and there is no comparison between Him and the person you're talking about. So it's by the will of Allah, and then by the will of so-and-so, versus by the will of Allah and the will of so-and-so. Because and means you've equated them. And then means you've made sure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater than, there is, uh, you know, there is no comparison between Him and the person that you're talking about. So the proper way to phrase such things is, were it not for the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then the help of the policeman, Okay, uh, the robber would have attacked our house. Were it not for the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then the driver of the car, we would have gotten into an accident. You cannot say were it not for the will of Allah, and the, the skills of the driver of the car. No, you've acquitted them. You have to make sure there's a clear differentiation between Allah's power and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will and decree, versus anyone else. Okay, so the Prophet is telling you the proper way to uh, phrase these type of statements. Naam. Yeah, yeah. Ibrahim. It is related about Ibrahim Nakhi that he dis- detested to say, I seek refuge in Allah and in you. But it is permitted to say, I seek Allah's refuge first and then yours. He said, say not if Allah and then so and so, and did not say if not Allah and so and so. Likewise, the follow-up from the same thing, Ibrahim al Nakhi, by the way, he is one of the, I think we mentioned this. Huh? No. Ibrahim Nakhi is one of the famous scholars of Iraq, and he was one of the teachers of the teachers of Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa is one of the graduates of his school, but not directly under him. I mean, his students taught uh, Abu Hanifa. And he himself, al Nakhai, is one of the students of the students of Ibn Basrud. <laughs> so he's in the, in the middle. Okay? Because Abu Hanifa is from the Iraqian school, right? Everyone knows about Abu Hanifa is from Iraq, right? Kufa. And Abu Hanifa obviously was following the school of Ibn Mas'ud, because Ibn Mas'ud was also from Kufa. So Ibn Mas'ud taught certain students, those students taught Ibrahim al Nakhai. Ibrahim al Nakhai taught certain scholars, those scholars taught Abu Hanifa. Okay? So he died like in the beginning half of the second century, like 100 somethings. So Ibn Ahim al Nakhai said, it is uh, not permitted to say, how do you translate that disliked? You translate that disliked? No, I Detested? Okay, yeah. It is not permitted is a better translation. It is not permitted to say that a person should say, I seek refuge in Allah and in you. It is not permitted to say that. Rather, you should say, I seek refuge in Allah and then in you. Again, making a differentiation. Same concept we're talking about, okay? Likewise, you should not say, were it not for Allah and you. Rather, you should say, were it not for Allah and then for you. Okay? Same concept, but one of the athar of the salaf talking about this concept. So basically, the point of this chapter was, we have to be careful who we attribute any good to. We have to be careful who we say prevented any evil from befalling us. We have to be careful in the words that we use because this could lead to minor shirk. Okay? And if someone says this unintentionally, it's not minor shirk inshallah if he says it, but the surface or it appears to be minor shirk. Therefore, it is, not, it, is, uh, it is not allowed to say this type of statement. So if someone says it intentionally, this might be minor shirk. But if you say it accidentally, just comes out of your mouth, right? Then, you know, seek Allah's forgiveness and repentance. But this act in and of itself, if you, if you intend in your heart that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected you through this person, you intend in your heart that Allah is the one that really did it, right? Were it not for Allah and the doctor, I would, I would have, you know, I would, not, I, would, I would not have been cured. This phrase is not proper. And, it's, and it, the, the outer surface, it seems to be minor shirk, okay? It seems to be minor shirk. So you should not say it. If it accidentally comes out of your mouth, and you don't intend to be that Allah, that the doctor is equivalent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you should seek Allah's forgiveness and refuge. And uh, if you said it in an audience, you should say it again properly. Were it not for Allah, and then the skills of such and such a doctor, uh, I would not have become cured. Okay, so we make sure the way that you phrase things, always you take it back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, Chapter 43. What is said about the one who is not satisfied with the note taken by Allah's name? Okay, so basically, now we move on to a similar chapter from, we're just talking about giving oaths by Allah's name, right? That is shirk to give an oath by other than Allah. Now we get to another point of that. 
and that is that when someone does give an oath by Allah using Allah's name, then it is obligatory upon us to believe him. Okay? When a Muslim comes to us and says, I swear by Allah I did not do this or I did do that, or whatever he's swearing, he uses Allah's name, then Allah's name is so great that we do we, we do not doubt him. We must believe him. Okay? This is the general scenario, this is the general case. If however you know for a fact, I mean a, beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is lying, or you have some, you know, great evidence, then of course this is a different thing. But we're talking about in general, if you have some suspicions or doubt, okay? Like, you know, um, you, you feel that so-and-so is backbiting about you, okay? He comes to you and says, I swear by Allah I did not backbite about you. Those suspicions and doubts should disappear. He is using Allah's name. And to use Allah's name is a very big thing. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is He? He is our creator. And to use His name in vain is a grave, grave, grave sin. So if you were to presume that your Muslim brother is lying using Allah's name, then you are presuming very, very evil thoughts of your Muslim brother. That he would resort to such a level that he would use Allah's name in vain. So if he is lying, that's between him and Allah. At the surface level, you believe him. Like I said, unless you know for a fact. I mean, 20 people have come to you and said they, they heard himself, they saw, they saw themselves that such and such a person did this. Obviously, you know for a fact that's a different story. doesn't matter if he you know, uh, swears by Allah or not. In, in a court of law, even it would not hold. You know, a Islamic court of law, I'm saying. It would not hold. If there are so many witnesses that saw him do this, and he swears by Allah he didn't do it, obviously this is a different thing. Now, when you have certain evidence, what we're talking about, when you have suspicions or doubts, when a person swears by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it is not allowed to deny his oath. It is not allowed to uh, disbelieve in him. Now, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu narrated that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Do not swear by your forefathers. Whoever swears by Allah, let him speak the truth. And the one from whom the oath is taken in the name of Allah should be satisfied with it. And whoever is not satisfied, it is not from the slaves of Allah. Now, in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ is saying, don't swear by your forefather. This was a common thing in the Jahiliyyah times, and it's still existent in many cultures, that you swear by your forefathers. Your father, your grandfather, your ancestors, anyone. Okay? And then, uh, and then the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever swears by Allah, then let him tell the truth. This is a warning. If you swear by Allah, to tell a lie in and of itself is a sin. So this doesn't mean if you don't swear by Allah, you can tell a lie. No. To tell a lie, obviously, is a major sin. Okay, but Allah, is, uh, the Prophet is re-emphasizing: if you if you do swear by Allah, then make sure you are telling the truth, or else. Make sure you are telling the truth, or else. And then, <coughs> the flip side of the coin: if someone swears to you using Allah's name, then be satisfied. If a Muslim comes to you and he uses Allah's name, accept what he says. Don't cause any problems about it. Believe him at face value. Okay, like we said, unless you know for a fact that what he's, you know, he's, you know, he's telling you that, uh, a lie, unless you know for a fact, we're talking about if you are, uh, if you have doubts. In this case, you must believe in this person when he swears to you by Allah. And then the Prophet said, whoever is not content, whoever is not satisfied, then this is not from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, this attitude, this feeling is not from Allah, it is not a correct feeling. Because the Muslim is using Allah's name. And when you use Allah's name, it is a great thing to use. So you assume the best of your Muslim brother, that he's not using Allah's name in vain. He would not stoop to such a level that he would lie using Allah's name. Okay? So you're not allowed to uh, reject a Muslim with, uh, testimony that when he swears by Allah, unless you know for a fact that he is lying. Otherwise, apart from that, you are not allowed to. If you have doubts in your heart, and you know you have... Even if you have, you know, uh, strong doubts, in the sense that, you know, you... you, you this might be his character or something that, he, something that he is accused of. But if he comes to you and swears by Allah that in this particular case he did not do it with you or for you or something, then you believe him. Until and unless you have some certain knowledge uh, to the contrary of that. Okay. Now, chapter number 44. How it is to say what Allah may will and you may will. Okay, we already talked about this in the previous chapter. Now we're going to have a whole chapter devoted to this. That saying whatever Allah wills and you will. And we said that this, is, this, on the face value of it, uh, it's a type of minor shirk. And if you intend it in your heart, it could be even major shirk. If you intend that it was actually by the will of such a person and not by the will of Allah, or by the will of Allah and the will of that person literally, that they both had to will it in order for it to occur, this is major shirk. Okay? But the statement in and of itself, the face value or the surface value of it, is that it is minor shirk in that you, attended, you intended that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will to do something and that other person uh, also will to do it. But it was the will of Allah that caused it to occur. So you say that were it not for, uh, for the will of Allah and, and the skills of, of my doctor, 
I would never have become cured. We said this is a type of uh, minor shirk and a person should seek refuge in Allah if he says this type of, uh, you know, seek forgiveness from Allah if he says this type of thing. Naam. Qutayla radiallahu anhu narrated, a Jew came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, your people commit shirk when they say by the will of Allah and with your will and say by Kaaba. Thereafter the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded the companions, radiallahu anhum, to swear by saying, by the rub of the Kaaba, and to say, by the will of Allah, and then with your will. Now, in this narration, uh, some Jews came to the Prophet, and they told him, you are committing shirk. Okay? Now, this is ironic here. This is ironic. The Jews are coming to the Prophet, and telling him that you are committing shirk. Okay? Who is committing shirk? The Jews are. Right? The Jews have rejected Allah and His Messenger. Okay? They have committed open blasphemy. And this is, uh, some of the ulama say that the reason, the reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed this to occur was so that the Jews themselves could realize at their own testimony that they were guilty of major shirk. They're coming and telling the Muslims they're guilty of minor shirk, right? And they're forgetting that they themselves were guilty of major shirk. So some of the ulama, they said that of the wisdom of this narration, of the wisdom that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused the Jews to come and not a Muslim or not, or not the Prophet himself beforehand, is to show, is to give the Jews um, their, their own testimony against themselves. Okay? Is that the Jews will testify against their own selves without even realizing it. When they come to the Muslims and they're accusing them of minor shirk, right, they're forgetting that they themselves are guilty of major shirk. Okay, so there is irony here, and this is a testimony that can be used against the Jews themselves. Okay, but the point is that the Prophet um, agreed with what they said, and he changed what the Muslims were doing. So what did the Muslims used to say? The Muslims used to say, whatever Allah wills, and you will. Like we said, you equate them. And they would swear by the Kaaba. And this was a Jahiliya custom to swear by the Kaaba. I swear by the Kaaba. Is the Kaaba created or not? Yes, it is a holy place, but it is created. Therefore, you are not allowed to swear by the Kaaba. So the Prophet ﷺ then commanded the Muslims that whenever they swore, they should swear. They should swear and say by the Lord of the Kaaba. And of course, you can say by the Lord of anyone, by the Lord of me, by the Lord of myself, by the Lord of my mother, by the Lord of my father. The Lord obviously then goes back to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Okay. Likewise, he commanded them to say whatever Allah wills, and then whatever you will. Okay. Whatever Allah wills, and then whatever. Uh, you will. Okay. Now, next. An Nisa'i also reported the hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. Once a man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, With the will of Allah and also with your will. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then said, Have you made me an associate with Allah? Rather, it is what Allah alone wills. In this narration, we see the eagerness of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to protect Tawheed. We see the, the swiftness with which he made sure that shirk was eradicated from its very roots. A man came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Whatever Allah wills and you, meaning the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. So immediately the Prophet ﷺ got angry at him and said, Have you made me an associate with Allah? Have you made me equivalent with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So look at the, the swiftness that the Prophet's reply came with. Even though, inshallah, the, the, the Muslim that came, he didn't mean to do shirk. He didn't mean that Muhammad sallallahu is Allah or equivalent to Allah. But out of respect and love for the Prophet he said, whatever Allah wills and you will. Okay? So immediately the Prophet said, have you made me an associate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Rather, whatever Allah wills alone is what occurs. I don't have a say in what occurs. But whatever Allah wills alone, that is what occurs. And look at now, look at the, look at the Prophet response himself, that he himself is saying, that what, uh, I, am not, I am not worthy of being elevated to the status. Don't make me to the level of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yet even a few days ago, I was talking to a brother. And he was telling me, this whole earth was not created except for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa The only reason that this earth and all of us were created was because of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay? Imagine had the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa heard this. This is major shirk, not minor shirk. Imagine had the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa heard this. What would his reaction be? This, what the man has said in this hadith is a type of minor shaykh. Whatever Allah wills and you will. The Prophet ﷺ immediately responded against him. That have you made me a partner with Allah? Have you made me a God besides Allah? Have you taken me to be an equivalent to Allah? Rather, whatever Allah wills alone. And yet this group, basically the Barilwis, they say that the purpose or a reason of existence is not the worship of Allah. It's because of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. Were it not for the Prophet ﷺ, we would not have been created. So our purpose of creation is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and this is this is. Yani, imagine, I mean, I was just 
what would the Prophet ﷺ's reaction be if he had heard these type of statements? You know, how angry he would have gotten. When he heard this slight statement, immediately he responded, Have you made me equivalent to Allah? And imagine had he been around, like, like the Quran says, that on that day, the day of judgment, those that are followed, right, will cut off the ties from those that follow them. Right, you understand this? We went over this verse. Those that are followed, meaning like Jesus Christ and all of the angels and the Prophet Muhammad and even with this group, they will cut off their ties with these type of people. In this world, they have wasted their whole lives presuming that they love so and so. The Christians have wasted their whole lives, the pious, quote unquote, pious amongst them, believing that they love Jesus Christ. And yet on the day of judgment, Isa a.s. will cut off all relationship with them. Likewise, these extremist Barelvis, right? They have wasted their whole lives presuming that they love Allah's Messenger. And they have forgotten the worship of Allah and they have committed shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on the day of judgment, the Prophet ﷺ will cut off ties with these type of people. And it is, it is, you know, they have wasted their whole lives in this thing, presuming that they are earning the rewards of Allah, and yet, on the day of judgment, they will have nothing with them. Now, move on. Ibn Majah reported from Tufail, radiallahu anhu, Aisha's brother from her mother's side, that he narrated, I had a dream in which I came upon a group of Jews, and said to them, You are indeed a good people, had you not claimed Uzair, alayhi salam, the son of Allah. Then they said, You too are good if you do not say what Allah may will and Muhammad may will. After that I came upon a group of Christians and said to them, You are indeed a good people if you do not claim Christ, the Son of Allah. Then they said, You too are good if you do not say what Allah may will and Muhammad may will. Then the, fo- the following morning I narrated the above event to some and came to the Prophet wasallam and repeated the whole event. He wasallam asked, Have you told this to anybody else? I said, Yes. Then he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, went to his pulpit, and after offering praises to Allah, said, Tufel had a dream, which he already had communicated to some of you. You used to say a sentence which, due to some hesitation, I could not prevent you from. Henceforth, do not say what Allah may will and Muhammad may will, but say what Allah may will alone. So in this hadith, Tufel, who was the half-brother of Aisha, anha, he saw a dream. Now realize, dreams are a number of types, you know. Basically, there are three types of dreams. A dream that comes from shaitan, a dream that comes from your own subconsciousness, and a dream that is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a dream that is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is 146th of prophethood, right? 146th of uh, prophethood, like the Prophet said in the hadith. So, a, a nightmare is always from shaitan. Anything that you see that is evil and terrifies you, it is from shaitan. So, when you see a nightmare, what should you do? You say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem, and you nafath, yani, like this, it's not a spit, you don't really spit, but it's the, 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 the um, air is expelled in a type of spit. You, you say this nafath three times to your left hand side, and you turn around. If you are on your left hand, you go to the right hand. If you are on the right hand, you go on, you basically change position. Likewise, if you, you know, if it was a very bad dream or you, you want to, it's encouraged to stand up, do wudu, and offer two rakahs also. And you do not tell anyone about your nightmare. No one. Your closest friend or your worst enemy. Don't tell anyone about your nightmare. Because it is from shaitan. Okay? So you don't tell anyone about your nightmare. This is, uh, many, unfortunately, many, many Muslims don't realize that. If you see an dream, evil dream where you see a relative die or you see something bad happening, okay? This is from shaitan. Don't, Allah's dreams are always going to be good dreams. He's giving you some good tidings, okay? Shaitan is the one that terrifies you. You know, you wake up and you're, you're, you're terrified, you're scared. This is from shaitan. It's not from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, a man came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, uh, I saw as if someone cut my head off and it was rolling on the floor and I was running after it trying to pick it up. You know? So the Prophet and laughed when he heard this because it's a funny dream. And he said, don't inform others about shaitan's playing with you at night. Okay? Don't go and tell other people what shaitan played with you last night. He's playing with your imagination. He's playing with you, trying to scare you. Okay? So don't go and tell other people about it. Even though he went and told the Prophet them. Okay, but don't go and tell other people about evil dreams. As for dreams that come from your own imagination, then, you know, the strange dreams that have no real meaning to them, you know, it's, you just wake up, I mean, you know, you want to see someone, I mean, dreams that have no meaning to them, okay? They don't really have good or bad, it's just, you, you see yourself anywhere. And as for dreams that are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then, they are a type of, you know, good news, a type of, you know, prediction, uh, that inshallah will come true in the future. And this is the type of dream that you should only tell the people that you trust. The dreams from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you should only tell the people that you trust and love. You should never tell your enemies and those that you feel might become jealous at you. Okay, the Prophet told us, only tell the people that you trust and love. Now, Tufayl saw a dream. And during the Prophet's time, obviously, uh, 
the Sahaba, it is possible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could show the Sahaba some dream. When they went and told the Prophet then the Prophet could use that dream as uh, something, as a type of inspiration for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can someone give another example? The Adhan. How is the Adhan revealed? Not Bilal, no. One of the Sahaba, Abdullah bin Zaid, he saw the Adhan in a dream. Okay, he saw the Adhan in a dream, and when he came and informed the Prophet about it, that's when it became a part of our Sharia. So our Sharia is not based upon Abdullah bin Zaid's dream. It is based on the Prophet ﷺ's approval of that dream. Okay, it's not based on the Sahaba's dream. It's not based on anyone's dream. But when the Sahabi came and told the Prophet and he approved of that, then it became a part of our Sharia. Likewise, the same thing happened in this hadith, that uh, this man saw a dream, Tufail, and he said, uh, I came across a group of Jews in his dream. And I said, you are great people, you are good people, if only you were not to say Uzaid is the son of Allah, and this is a group of Jews that used to live at the Prophet's time. I don't know if they are still existent, I have not heard of this group of Jews that are still existent, but they did exist at the Prophet's time. There was a group of Jews, they would say that Uzaid is the son of Allah. So the Jews responded back to him, and you too are a great people, if only you were not to say whatever Allah wills and whatever Muhammad wills. Again, minor shirk. And again, the irony is that they have done major shirk, and they're pointing out minor shirk in the Muslims. Okay? And we explain this, that this, uh, some scholars have interpreted this to mean that this is the testimony of the Jews against themselves. That they're accusing the Muslims of minor shirk, and they're forgetting that to claim that Uzayr is the son of Allah is blasphemy and major shirk at the same time. Okay, so then the Sahabi passed by some Christians in his dream, and he said, you too, you are uh, good people, if only you were not to say that the Messiah is the son of Allah. So they, they responded, and you too are good people, if only you do not say that whatever Allah wills and Muhammad wills. So when, it, uh, when he woke up, he came to the Prophet and he informed some people. So the Prophet asked him, have you informed someone? Have you informed people? He said, yes. So the Prophet stood up, praised Allah, gave his speech, and he said, whatever, uh, as to what follows, Tufail saw a dream last night and he informed some of you about it. And you used to say something that I did not prohibit you from saying because of such and such a reason. Now this reason, according to uh, some ulama, is that the Prophet was was uh, shy to give a ruling without some type of inspiration from Allah. Okay? Because this wasn't major shirk. The Sahaba were not doing major shirk when they said whatever Allah wills and whatever Muhammad wills. Okay? They realized, the Sahaba, they realized that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is obviously Allah and the Muhammad is just a messenger, a prophet. Okay, so it is not major shirk. So the Prophet was was shy to enact a ruling to to enforce them to do something until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had inspired him to. Now when Tufil saw this dream, then the Prophet realized that this was an inspiration from Allah. Like I said, some dreams are a type of wahi, a type of uh, this wahi is not the type that makes you a prophet obviously. So it's one forty sixth part of prophethood, a, a pious dream. Uh one forty sixth part of prophethood. By the way, why is it one forty six? Does anyone know? Well, there's obviously the hadith, yeah, but why this particular number? The Prophet said a pious dream is 146th part of prophethood. Anyone can guess a reason for this number? <laughs> Even if it does, so what? <laughs> 6 minus 4 equals 2. That's good too. 6 divided by 4 equals 1.6. No, okay, no one knows, let me tell you. Simple thing. How long was the process of the Prophet? How many years? 23. 23. Okay? Before, before the first surah was revealed, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. The Prophet used to see dreams in his sleep. Right? He would see a dream at night and in the morning that dream would become true. How long did he see those type of dreams? Six months, exactly. For six months before his Prophet, before Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq was revealed, he used to see dreams every night. He would see something and the next morning it would become true just like the sun would rise up. I mean, as surely as the sun would rise up, like Aisha says, this is one of the first hadith of Sahih Bukhari. The one of the first hadith of Sahih Bukhari. That the Prophet ﷺ, before his Prophet had started, for six months he would see dreams that would come true the next morning. Whatever would happen in his dream, it would come true. Okay? So, 6 over 23 equals... Sorry, 0.5 over 23. 0.5 meaning because 6, is, six months is uh, half a year. Right? 0.5 over 23 equals 1 over 46. So, true dreams are 146 part of prophethood. Is that fraction clear? Simple, right? Huh? Simple math. <laughs> huh? The Prophet would see pious dreams for 6 months, right? 
meaning true dreams for six months. And he was a prophet for 23 years. Six months divided by 23 years equals 1 over 46. Okay? So that's why the Rulam says he said 146. Anyway, getting back to the hadith. Footnote. Back to text mode. So when Tufayl saw this dream, the Prophet realized that this was Allah's you know, inspiration basically, that this should be stopped now. Okay? So the Prophet then said, Do not say, Masha Allahu wa Sha'a Muhammad. Rather say, Masha Allahu wahdahu. They used to say, Masha Allahu wa Sha'a Muhammad. Okay? And like we said, the reason that the Prophet did not prohibit them was because the Sahaba, they realized Tawheed, they were not saying this like the believers of today say. They realized Allah is Allah and the Prophet is the Prophet. They realized the difference. So this is not major shirk, this is not shirk. Okay, but and so the Prophet was shy to enact a ruling to command them to do something, even though Allah had not told him to, uh, that Allah had not revealed anything to him. So he was shy to give a ruling from himself. So therefore, he said, "Such and such prevented me." In other words, he was not, he did not feel uh, right to give a ruling from himself. He was waiting for an inspiration to come. When the Tufail saw his dream, when Tufail saw his dream, the Prophet realized that this was a type of inspiration from Allah. Therefore, he commanded them uh, to stop saying this type of statement. Now. Chapter number 45 Whoever curses time has wronged Allah Whoever curses time has wronged Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Okay So in this um, Really a more correct translation Not wrong but uh, He has caused a type of harm to Allah Now can anyone harm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No So the, basically what the process uh, means in the hadith that we're going to quote Is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how best How this hadith means We don't Get into the details of it. Like we said about the names and attributes of Allah, we don't get into the howness of it. We do acknowledge and realize that nothing is capable of harming Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like Allah said, that if all of mankind, the first of them to the last of them, you know, and if all of the jinn, the first of them to the last of them, were to disbelieve in me, it would not change or it would not make my kingdom deficient even in the least. Allah's kingdom is not, uh, you know, harmed or aided if anyone becomes Muslim or, or rejects him. Okay? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best how, uh, what he means by this type of uh, statement. And we leave the meanings of this to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while fully acknowledging and realizing that nothing can harm Allah the way that we know the, understand the meaning of this word. Okay? Nothing can harm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, at all. But we, uh, we leave the hadith because the Prophet said it, we don't get into the, uh, the exact howness of it. So basically, if someone were to curse time, then he is, it is as if he is doing some type of wrong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do you mean by curse time? So it, was, it was a custom of the jahili is that they would actually curse the time that something occurred. Uh, what an evil you know, Saturday that is. You know? What an evil or what a bad Saturday. May Allah curse or may that Saturday be cursed that this occurred. So you're cursing time. Okay, you're cursing time. This is different from describing time that you say, "Oh, last Saturday was very bad for me. This happened." That's fine. You're describing what happened to you on that Saturday. You're not cursing that Saturday. You're not cursing time. You understand the difference? And the, if you describe what occurred to you on a certain day, and you say, "Oh, that that month of the year was, you know, it was very bad for me because this this has occurred." Okay, so you're just saying the time frame was bad. That's not cursing time. But when you literally go and curse it, oh, that month may Allah curse that month. May Allah curse time, or, you, or may that time be cursed, may that day be cursed. This is where you have done wrong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Naam. Allah the Almighty said, and they say, there is nothing but our life of this world. We die and we live and nothing destroys us except adhar. And they have no knowledge of it, they only conjecture. Now in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing the uh, disbelievers in Him. The disbelievers in the, the day of judgment, they would say, <coughs> "All that we are living, all that we have, is our life, the life of this world." dunya. The only thing that exists is the life of this world. Memutu wa nahya. We were going to live, and we're going to die. You know, we're just going to live these years, and we're going to die again. That's it. There's not going to be a day of judgment. There's not going to be a resurrection, and nothing will destroy us except time. Wama yuhlikuna illa dahr. Nothing will destroy us except time. So in this, in this verse, in this verse, it is as if they're attributing the cause of death to time. Okay? Whereas they don't realize that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is the one that causes them to die. And this is also shows you one of the uh, tricks, if you like, of those that disbelieve in Allah, is they like to invent names and concepts and attribute things to these names and concepts even though they don't exist. What is time? Can time do anything to you? No. Time... They cannot do anything to you. And yet they will say, nothing destroys us except time. But time can't do anything to you. 
Can anyone think of certain phrases that our people of today have invented, the, the Christians and Jews? They don't really exist, but they attribute everything to these phrases. There's one particular phrase that even the atheists, they use all the time. Mother Nature. I think the sister said that. Mother Nature. That's exactly the word. Mother Nature. What is Mother Nature? It doesn't exist. It's just two words you invented. Okay? If you were to ask them, uh, I mean, you always hear them, even on documentaries, you know, Mother Nature will that. How can Mother Nature will anything? Mother Nature doesn't exist. Even these pagans, even these rejectors of God, they realize that there's got to be something. Mother Nature will that, you know, uh, this occurs. Or Mother Nature, uh, you know, cared for this. Mother Nature doesn't exist. There's no such thing. Likewise, Father Time, you know. Mother Nature and Father Time, they're not married, by the way, for some reason. I don't know why. But, what, is the, what are these concepts? Like Allah says in the Quran, these are only names that you have invented you and your forefathers. These are only names. They don't have any reality to them. Okay? Likewise, we see in this verse, the Mushrikun said the same thing. Nothing will destroy us except time. What is time? Time can't destroy you. Time can't do anything. Okay? So in this verse, we find another benefit from this verse is that of the acts and of the customs of uh, the disbelievers as they like to invent these names and concepts that really don't exist and you know, attribute any good or evil uh, to them. Now, move on. Narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah said, the son of Adam wrongs me for he curses Adar, though I am Adar. In my hands are all things and I cause the revolution of day and night. Go on, go on. In another version wherein it is said, Do not abuse Adar, for Allah is Adar. Adahar, Adahar means time, basically. Adahar means time. Okay? So, the Prophet said um, that Allah said, What type of hadith is it? Raise your hands. The Prophet said that Allah said, How come not every one of you is raising his hands? Every one of you should raise his hands. We just did this yesterday, two days ago. The Prophet said that Allah said, I still see it. Now you know it. Okay. Huh? What is it? No, you. No, when the Prophet says that Allah says. What type of hadith is this? We know you know Abdul Rahman, it's alright. <laughs> what is it, Yaqi? Hadith? Qudsi, exactly. Hadith Qudsi. Everyone should know this now. Come on, we, we went over this, okay? The Prophet Wasallam said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, this is a Hadith Qudsi. The son of Adam wrongs me, or we said the Prophet, uh, a more literal translation is, causes me, you know, some discomfort or harm, and we said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above being caused discomfort and harm, so we accept this word of the Prophet Wasallam and we leave the meanings of it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How does he do this? How does the son of Adam do this? He curses time. Yasubuddah, he curses time. And I am time. How is Allah time? Time is not one of the names of Allah. None of the scholars, of, none of the reputable scholars of Islam said this. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ, or in this hadith Qudsi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explained what he meant. I change the night into day and I change the day into night. So Allah's, one of Allah's names is not time. None of the famous scholars said this except for Ibn Hazm. But none of the scholars said that uh, Allah's name is time. When Allah is saying, I am time, he then went on and explained what he meant. I am the one that causes the night to change into the day and the day to change into the night. And in our times, we know how, uh, how or what method Allah used to do, to, to do this, is that He causes the earth to rotate around the sun. And He causes that now, uh, you know, the earth is rotating on its own ax- axis, that's day and night. And then the, ro- the earth rotates around the sun, that is the year, right? And the moon rotates around the earth, and that is the month. Okay? So who is the one that causes all of these rotations? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, I am time. Okay? And in one, in one narration He said, in my hands is time. Meaning that, not a, this doesn't mean that one of Allah's names is time. No, no one says this, like I said, none of the famous scholars. What it means is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that causes time to change. No one causes time to change except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? Allah is the one that, you know, He causes time to keep on proceeding. He is the one that causes the earth to rotate around its own axis. He causes the moon to rotate around the earth. He causes the earth then to rotate all around the sun. So we get our days, our months, our years, our hours, our second. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that does this. So Allah is the one that has created time for us. This is what is the meaning of the statement that the son of Adam curses me. Uh, how does he do this? He curses time and I am time. And that in that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that... Um, uh, causes time to uh, you know go forward. Now an- another benefit from this hadith is we are not allowed to curse anything that Allah subhanahu wa taala created or is the cause of. 
I mean, in a sense, Allah is the direct cause of specifically when it comes to nature. For example, the um, the wind, okay. For example, uh, the cold, extreme cold. We should not curse these things. We should. We might seek Allah's refuge from them. That's fine, okay. But we should not curse these type of things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created unless we have some uh, you know, evidence in the Quran and Sunnah to do so. So specifically with regards to things that Allah has created that are you know, from nature, we are not allowed to curse them. This is another benefit we can derive from this hadith because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that has created these things. So if a strong wind is blowing, what would the Prophet say? I seek Allah's refuge in the evil of this wind. He didn't curse it. No. I seek Allah's refuge in the evil of this wind. Okay. Likewise, even if a tornado or something like a, a natural calamity occurs, we don't curse that thing. Because we realize Allah is the one that caused it to occur. So when we curse that thing, it is as if we are cursing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because who is the one that caused it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this, the point of this chapter is you do not curse these type of natural occurrences. If it's extremely hot, extremely cold, okay, you don't curse it. Okay. You seek Allah's refuge from it, fine, that's fine. You seek Allah's refuge from the evil of that, that's fine. But to curse that directly, it is as if you are cursing the one that... Uh, caused it. Naam. Chapter 46 To be named judge of judges and the like. Okay, in this, uh, like I said, like I said yesterday, most of these chapters are dealing with various types of minor shaykhs, specific with regards to phrases, okay? Um, and the point is, all we, all, over and over again, we have to realize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is far greater than any other thing or any other object or any other person that we can imagine. So one of the ways that we can uh, you know, do some type of kufr or some type of shirk is when we call someone the judge of judges. Okay? The judge of judges. Because the judge of judges, who is going to judge the judges? In this life we have judges, yes. We have Muslim judges, we have Catholic judges. But who is going to be the judge of the judges? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these type of names, these type of, you know, superlative names, I mean, they're extreme praise, they should be given only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Naam. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, The most perfidious name to Allah is a man calling himself Malik al-Amlak. In fact, there is no king but Allah. And Sufyan said? Sufyan said, another example is the title of Shahanshah. Okay, move on to the next hadith also. In another version, Allah will be most enraged on the day of judgment and the most wicked. Okay, now in this hadith, the Prophet said that the most lowest, that the most debased, the most humiliated, the most, you know, uh, and basically the lowest name in the sight of Allah will be a man who calls himself Malikul Amlak, the king of kings. Okay, Malikul Amlak, the king of kings. We have kings in this world, yes, but who is the king of kings? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this world we have presidents, we have leaders, but who will be the leader of those leaders? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, in this world, a person who calls himself the king of kings, he would consider himself the highest, right? So on the day of judgment, Allah will make him the lowest. He said the lowest person, the worst person, the most debased person in the sight of Allah on the day of judgment will be a person who calls himself the king of kings. There is no king except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La malika illallah. There is no owner and there is no you know, king except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sufyan, uh, I don't know if it's Saudi or, or Ibn Uyuni, one of the famous scholars, he said that a similar title is Shahin Shah. Who called himself Shahin Shah, by the way? No, we're not talking about the restaurant in Houston. <laughs> Even though that name should not be kept for the restaurant. But who called himself Shahin Shah? The Persian king. Right? The, uh, <coughs> the kings of Iran. Right? The, uh, the Shah of Iran, I think he also called himself. You know, the king of kings. Shah Shah means the king of kings. Okay, so we say the worst name in the sight of Allah will be a person who called himself the king of kings. And now look at the look at what the author said in his title, though. What did the author say in his title? Judge of judges. What does the hadith say? So what is the author trying to show you? It's the same thing, but more than that. It, exactly, it's the concept. It's the concept. It's not just this one hadith that only the king of kings is prohibited. Judge of judges is allowed. No. 
It's the, in, in Islam, you go to the concept. You, do, you, you don't just go to the labels. Okay? When the Prophet is forbidding the king of kings, right? Then this automatically implies other such titles. You know, the judge of judges. You know, the owner of owners. You know, the lord of well, no, yeah, well, the lord in itself, the word Rabb. You know. Yes, the king of the universe, Maliki Umiddin, yeah, the king of the universe, yeah. Uh, this is, all of this is a type of shirk. Uh, I said this uh, last year too when I was teaching this book, and I'm going to say it again, that uh, I really and sincerely do believe this, that our modern day cartoons and our modern day movies are brainwashing our children to commit shirk. Okay? And I say this, I know, I know this sounds real far-fetched and everything, but I say no, this is what I f- firmly believe firmly believe that cartoons that these people Hollywood and what I don't know who I don't know who produced cartoons maybe no whatever you know whatever these shows that produce cartoons I sincerely believe that one of their aims and goals is to basically eradicate the concept of Tawheed in the minds of the children that's why you find cartoons such as He-Man what is his title? Master of the Universe okay the, this title Master of the Universe Rabbul Alameen this is exactly the meaning of it Rabbul Alameen Okay? I know it sounds funny, but think about it for a while. When your child is grown up, watching these type of things, okay? Superman, right? He can do anything he wants, right? He-Man. I, I, I don't even know what other cartoons are out there now. I mean, you know, Hercules, okay? All of these type of things. <laughs> All of these type of things, okay? By the way, Simpsons is meant to corrode family values. That's another thing. You know, to treat your father with disrespect, okay? To... Uh, that's that's another that's for another reason. Okay. <laughs> so all of but I'm I'm being serious. If you think about it, ponder about it. When your child from childhood he's hearing these phrases, Maliki, I mean Rabbul Alamin, Master of the Universe. Okay. Well, I'm scared. If you go to a child and ask him who is the Master of the Universe, he'll say He Man, a Muslim child. You know. If you go and ask him who is the Master of the Universe, he won't think of Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin. He'll think of every day at five thirty he's gonna see his He Man. You know. I don't know if it's, are they still showing it up, but the point is, these type of titles, these type of phrases, you are, this, the, the, the stories of the children of old that used to be recited to, they were nice stories with morals to them. You look at, you know, ACF's fables, right? You know? Very famous stories, right? Very nice, most of them. They have a moral to it. They have a theme to it. This is what the, what the people of old used to teach their kids. Not superhuman ideas and, you know, philosophies and people are doing this. When you're going to cause your child to be grown up on these type of thoughts and ideas, okay, what do you think will be his perspective of Allah and His Messenger? He say, what's the big deal? He-man can do that too, you know. He, he actually believes in these type of things, you know. And I remember myself as a kid, you know, we used to argue with, uh, with other kids who is greater, He-man or Superman or, you know, back then in the early 80s, these things were very hot, you know. He-Man, Spider-Man, Superman, all of this, you know. Uh, what is that other guy, that green guy? Hulk, Hulk yeah, you know. <laughs> you know, we, have to, we used to have literal arguments, you know, literally. No, this is, He-Man couldn't do this, Superman. But these people don't exist, you know. You're causing your child to be brainwashed by these type of themes and ideas so that when the real names and attributes of Allah are presented to him, he might even make fun of them, astaghfirullah. Or at the least, he won't think them as great as otherwise. Because he's already been exposed to these supernatural people that, you know, supposedly exist. Okay, and you know, obviously, from a moral standpoint, of course, cartoons and movies and, f- and everything is out there to destroy your family values. Okay, specifically when it comes to uh, you know men and women interaction, the status of women, um, uh, even in our times, homosexuality. You know, and uh, I'll, I'll give something away. A few years ago, I used to watch uh, what's this called, uh, Simpsons, right? And one show that I watched, okay, it caused me to stop watching that show afterward. It was a show dedicated to showing that homosexuals were normal human beings. The Simpsons. The Simpsons. Right? The whole show was dedicated to showing that gays are normal people. Now, when your 10-year-old kid watches that, and he comes to the mission and he hears that, you know, and by the way, the whole point was, Bart, obviously the cool kid, right? He's taking and accepting this homosexual friend. Whereas the father... He is the backward guy, you know, in his stupidity. And he's the one that's having fears about this, you know. And Bart's real cool about it. So what if he's gay? No big deal. Okay. Now, when your kid comes and he sees his uncles all talking about, you know, gays and putting them down, who is he going to think of? Bart or or Homer? Homer, obviously. And he's going to think himself to be? Bart. Oh, look at these backward guys. They think like homosexuality. The point is, whoever examines these cartoons and these movies and these films and examines them not just like a blind person looking at the TV and you know but really examines what's going on you know think and ponder about it you will realize without a shadow of a doubt these people are out there to brainwash you 
the people in charge of these organizations are all liberals. They are all liberals. They're not even of the conservative Americans. Which is why even Orthodox and pious Christians don't even like these type of stuff. Okay? They are not the average Americans even. They are the liberals out there. They are out there to brainwash your children. They're out there to brainwash you. Okay? And unfortunately, too many of us fall for it. You know? We sit there, we watch TV, we don't realize that. Forget the fact we're committing sins when we watch women and we see these music and all of this stuff. Forget that. The point is, these subtle concepts and images are ingrained in our mind and our heads. Okay? And this is the, the greater danger of, of television that not many people talk about. The greater danger of television and of movies and of all of this is that they end up brainwashing your children and, e- and even you. And that was a side point here, but like, and this, I, it, I was reminded of this when this, uh, you know, the judge of judges and the king of kings came. Okay? You have so many of these type of movies and so many of these type of cartoons around. They're all talking about divine names and attributes. Only Allah is worthy of these type of titles and they're giving them to other concepts that don't exist. So when your child will be really exposed to the names and attributes of Allah, I fear that he might just say, so what? You know, I mean, he man's there or whatever. I mean, or at the least is that he will not appreciate it to the level that he should. Why? Because he's already grown up on supernatural stuff. He's already grown up on these type of people that can do these type of things. Whereas the proper stories that you know, forget, okay, obviously the religion has its place, right? But even the non-religious stories that you tell your child, if you go back to the past, you find that they were good stories, stories that had some moral values to them, stories that had themes to them, stories that would make you think. The hare and the tortoise, for example, right? A nice story. Instead of, you know, growing your, your children up on these type of stuff, why don't you tell them these type of stories too? Of course, religion obviously teaches them Quran and Sunnah, and, you know, but at the same time, if you have to give them some other stuff, give them stuff that has moral values to it, instead of going to... Uh, you know, he man and you know, uh, she what? Sheba, Shira, whatever. Yeah, I, I stopped watching cartoons for a while, except for Bart Simpson. That was the show that caused me to stop watching Bart Simpson. After I saw that show, I was like, halas, I can't, you know, <laughs> can't do that anymore, you know. So uh, with that, inshallah, uh, we'll open the floor for questions, inshallah. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll do one chapter, one more chapter then, yeah. One more chapter. One hadith. Chapter 47, Respect for the Name. Brothers, can you Nabil. Chapter 47, Respect for the Names of Allah and Changing One's Name for the Sake of That. So in this chapter, basically, again, the same concept when it comes to the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it comes to certain names, then obviously, as just like we're not allowed to keep names that have a type of shirk in them, likewise, we're not allowed to keep names that show some type of, uh, you know, uh, greatness or grandeur. We're not allowed to keep these type of names. So therefore, if we have a name that has some type of uh, title to it or some type of thing that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is deserving of, then we have to change it out of respect for Allah's names and His attributes. And this is why, for example, a person was called Abdullah in the Prophet's time, he would change it to Abdullah. Or Abd shams right? He would change it to Abdul Rahman. The, the servant of the Shams, the worshipper of the Shams, he would change the name because this is a name of shirk and a name of uh, kufr. Likewise, in our times, some common names are Abdul Nabi. Abdul Nabi is a common name. You know? Huh? Ghulam Nabi is also not a proper name. Ghulam Nabi is not a proper name to have. Okay? Likewise, uh, um, who can think of some other names that have shirk and kufr in them? You know? Hmm? Well, the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are divided into two categories. Those that you can call other people and call Allah, and those that you can only call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, Ar-Rahman. Can you call anyone Rahman? No, you have to call him Abdul Rahman. How about Rahim? Yes, you can. Rahim means merciful. So if a person is merciful, you can describe him as being Rahim. But you cannot describe him as Ar-Rahim. Alif Lam, Ar-Rahim. When you add that Alif Lam, then it is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So, for example, Rabbul Alameen, Lord of the Universe, right? No one, no one can have this title except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No concept, no human being can have this title except for Allah. So, you have to divide names into those two categories. Basit is one of the names that is fine to uh, give to a human being. But Abdul Basit is his proper name. Khalid, you know, yeah, that's what. Huh? Khalid, no. Creator, no. Abdul, uh, you know, some names that, you know. Okay. Tayyip, so, quote the hadith. It is narrated from Abu Sh- Shure, radiallahu anhu, his kunya was Ab- Abu Hakim. Abu Hakim. Abu Hakim. So the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, once said to him, Allah is al Hakim, and his judgment is to prevail. Then Abu Shure said, my people came to me for 
adjudication of their disputes, and when I judge between them, both parties are pleased with my judgment. The Prophet ﷺ rejoined, How excellent is this? Do you have any children? I said, Yes. Shurhe Muslim and Abdullah. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, Who is the eldest? I said, Shurhe. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, You are henceforth to be called Abu Shurhe. Shurayh. Shurhe. Shurayh. Shurayh, sorry, sorry. Okay, now Abu Shurayh came. His kunya Abu Shurayh was Abu al-Hakam. Hakam is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore when he's called, and what does Hakam mean? The judge. Okay? So, but since Al-Hakam is one of the names of Allah, Abu Al-Hakam, the father of Hakam, it is as if it's a type of challenge to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Now, so the Prophet said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْحَكَمْ Allah is the only judge. وَإِلَيْهِ الْحُكُمْ And to him all judgment belongs. Okay? This hadith shows you that when it comes to judgment, we have to go back to the Quran and the Sunnah, not to other laws. Okay? We have to go back to the Quran and Sunnah. So the Prophet said, it is as if he's reprimanding him. Why is this your name? Abu Al-Hakam. Okay? Why is your name Abu Al-Hakam? Because, why does, it, does it, everyone understand why? Allah's name is Al-Hakam. So it should be Abdul Hakam, not Abu Al-Hakam, the father of Hakam. So the, they said, what, did, what, did, what was his excuse? He said, when my people, they differ, when they have a fight, right? They come to me. So I have that status, I am trusted by my people, they come to me, and I judge between them, and both parties are always pleased with what I, what I judge. So the person said, how beautiful this is. In other words, so mashallah, this shows that you have good qualities and good attributes, that your people will come to you and accept your judgment between them. Okay? So he said, how beautiful this is, but still he wanted to change his name. That doesn't give it a valid excuse if you have a, if you have a name that is a you know, uh, type of... Uh, going against Allah's names and attributes. So he asked him, who is your greatest or who is your oldest son? Or do you have any sons? He said, I have Shuraih and Muslim and Abdullah. He said, who is the oldest? He said, Shuraih. He said that in that case, your name is Abu Shuraih. Abu Shuraih. So this shows you also that the custom or the culture is to keep your kunya after your oldest son. But this is not like, you, call, you, don't, you don't call this sunnah. You know, I mean, this is not something, you know, but it's just the custom and the culture of the Arabs of their time. And, uh, you know, those that want to keep a kunya, it's allowed to keep a kunya. This is the way that you should do it. And it's not haram or shirk if you don't, or you, or you do it otherwise. It's just, a kunya is just something, a title that you keep, you know, abu so-and-so, you know, or um so-and-so for the sisters, um so-and-so. Uh, Aisha, uh, the Prophet gave her the kunya of Umm Abdullah, even though she had no Abdullah. But she just gave her the title of Umm Abdullah. Okay. Um, so if someone wants to keep a kunya, it's allowed, permissible to, for him to do so. And if he keeps it from his oldest son, then this is also encouraged. And it's no sin or no you know, problem if he doesn't keep one, or if he uh, keeps one other, to other than his son. As long as the, mean, main, uh, the meaning is correct. So the Prophet when this name, Abu al-Hakam, came, he changed it to Abu Shurih. Why? Because Hakam is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? Now also the name um, Abu al-A'la. Okay? Who is called Abu al-A'la, by the way? Maududi, right? Rahimahullah, we ask Allah to forgive him. This name is not correct according to many ulama. Because A'la is one of the attributes. So, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la. Okay? So, Abu al-A'la, right? There is, uh, you know, I mean, there is some type of uh, problem in that name. You know, may Allah forgive him and uh, guide his followers to the truth in our times. But uh, that name in and of itself, Abu al-A'la, is not a proper name, you know? Uh, Abu al-A'la because the same thing this is Abu al-Hakam and that was Abu al-A'la both of them are names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the point is when you have a name that has a meaning of shirk or a meaning of kufr then you must change that name you are not allowed to keep that name okay you must change that name out of respect of Allah's names and attributes uh, with that we'll take a break inshallah question and answers and then take a break subhanakallahumma bihamdik shadu la ilaha anta astaghfiruk wa atubu ilaik you mentioned dreams. What about dreams that are strange or good with elements of bad? Like I said, dreams that are strange, they don't seem to have any meaning to them. Uh, most likely these are from your own subconscious uh, mind, you know. Dreams are of three types, like I said, from shaitan, from Allah, and from yourself, okay. So, uh, dreams that are from, uh, you know, from yourself, they have really no meaning or no substance to them. Strange, wild things, I mean, nothing, nothing evil or nothing bad, you know. Uh, dreams that have some good and elements of bad, well, it depends. I mean, the elements of bad, are they uh, part of your imagination or not? Or if they, you know, in general, the dreams from shaitan are nightmares. I mean, they're really, really evil dreams, okay? If you have a dream which is some good and some bad, most likely it's from your own imagination. These type of dreams, they have no, you know, it's just your subconscious mind uh, uh, thinking away, you know? And some of the scholars, they say that uh, this is your spirit meeting other spirits. Allah knows, you know? Because, you know, when you go to sleep, your spirit leaves your body, right? You, everyone knows this, right? When you go to sleep, your spirit leaves your body. This is why the Prophet said, 
that uh, sleeping is the brother of death. Sleeping is the brother of death. And this is why the majority of mankind dies in their sleep. The majority of mankind, they die in their sleep. They go to sleep and they never wake up. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as He says in the Quran, He takes the soul at night and He just doesn't send it back. He keeps it with Him. The soul that He takes, that the person was going to die. So every night our souls go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those that are willed to die, they don't come back. Those that are willed to live one more day, they come again. Okay? So every time we go to sleep, we should make a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, Oh Allah, like the Prophet say, cause me to die as a Muslim and, and cause me to live as a Muslim. Okay? Uh, this type of dream most likely is from your imagination. Allah knows best. Can evil dreams be true as well? If a dream is a nightmare, then this is from shaitan, and we should not even think about it. You know, we should not think about it. Okay? Allahu alam. It is possible that you might see a dream where you are warned against something, like Allah might be warning you against something. Allahu alam. I don't know. We have to go to the scholars of dreams. Uh, for this type of thing But in general If you see a nightmare Then you should not even think about it And you should seek Allah's refuge From the evil of what you saw You should not even You know bother You realize that shaitan Is playing with your mind You know shaitan is just uh, Trying to do things to you So if it's an evil dream The more you think about it The more shaitan is succeeding In his uh, In his uh, You know trying to play around with you So don't think about it at all And the dreams from Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala Like we said They are good dreams In other words They're trying to give you Some good predictions Like that You know what about teaching children via cartoons, good stories, of, or Islamic stories, or do they come under the category of images and pictures which are forbidden? That's a good question, you know. Cartoons, do they come under... Uh, for sure, drawing cartoons does. What's the difference between drawing cartoons and showing cartoons? For sure, the, ar- the organizations and companies that are drawing these cartoons, they should stop doing them and they fall under the images that are prohibited. Okay? There is no that when you draw a human being so clearly and explicitly like these, uh, what are some Islamic cartoons, Suleiman or something? And uh, the Invincible Abdullah too? Yeah. All of this stuff. Huh? Huh? <laughs> Adam? Adam's world? All I say is it is very sad that the state of the Muslims has degenerated to such, such a level where we need to use puppets to teach our children how to pray. That's all I say. It is very sad that in order to make our children be enthusiastic about prayer, we have to show them a little puppet and how he prays. You know, I just you know, I say it's very sad that we have resorted to this level. Um, but for sure, you know, drawing these type of cartoons is not allowed because it comes under the image making of the Prophet As for showing them... Well, I don't think that you're going to have any cartoon that doesn't have music in it, right? All of these cartoons would have music in them, right? Well, music is haram without any doubt, you know? I mean, I wouldn't encourage this. Besides, you have much better things to do than, you know, show your children cartoons, you know? Go out with them for a walk in the park is better than showing them this cartoon. Teach them Islamic stories, teach them morals, even, you know, Aesop's fables, whatever. A lot of these stories are much better to tell your children than, than these cartoons, you know? I mean, I would not encourage any parent especially, any Muslim, but any parent especially to have a TV at his home. I would not encourage any parent to have a TV at his home. Children become addicted to it and, you know, they are brainwashed beyond, uh, beyond repair sometimes. <laughs> beyond repair. No. Is it okay to interpret your dreams and other people's dreams? What if it is very clear what is signified? Uh, yeah, there's a good book by Abu Amina. You should read it. Um, Dream Interpretation Based on Authentic uh, Quran and Sunnah. I don't remember the title, but it's something like this, you know. Dream Interpretation by Abu Amina. Do not buy the book that says Ibn Sirin's Dictionary of Dreams. Do not buy that book. It is not Ibn Sirin's Dictionary of Dreams. It is a forged document. Ibn Sirin, Muhammad Ibn Sirin. Who is Muhammad Ibn Sirin? Student of? No. No. No, keep on guessing. Astaghfirullah. <laughs> huh? Ibn Sirin was a student of Abu Huraira. He died 110 Hijriya. That book that is said, Ibn Sirin's Dictionary of Dreams, right? It is not his book. Ibn Sirin was famous for interpreting dreams, but that is not his book. And by the way, if you ever read it, you will realize why. It is perverted. It is downright perverted. You go up and look, you know, you, look, you can look up some body parts in there too, by the way. You know, look it up and you'll read some perverted stuff there. It's more likely authored by Freud than by Ibn Sirin. You know, I mean, it's really weird stuff. Do not buy that book. 
Ibn Sirin did not have any book out. He was a great alim interpreter of dreams, but he doesn't have a book out. Okay? The best book is get Abu Amina's book, and you, uh, a, lot, a lot of your questions about dreams will be answered. Is it okay to interpret your dreams or other people's dreams? Unless you're qualified to it. This is something that Allah SWT gives people. He gives people the gift of interpreting dreams. It's not something that you'll study with a book most likely. It's just, it's just something, a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What if, it's, if, it, if it is clear in what it signifies, then you, don't, then you don't need it to be interpreted. If it is clear in what it signifies, you don't need it to be interpreted. You know? uh, anyway, it's a clear thing, then there is no interpretation needed. But still, if you go to some pious people uh, that you feel that they can interpret dreams, then it will be good, inshallah, to do that. If a person dreams that they're in heaven, or they have some pious, or they've seen some pious people, does that indicate anything? Inshallah, it indicates some good, but you can't, you know, you can't uh, say for sure you're going to enter heaven, but inshallah, that indicates some good, you know, that indicates some, like if he sees the Prophet in a dream, inshallah, we hope good for him, you know, I mean, that he saw the Prophet in a dream, you know, we hope good for him, uh, but it doesn't mean that for sure he's going to enter Jannah or anything. Any person that thinks that after he sees a dream, that for sure that dream was from shaitan, you know, any person that thinks that, that khalas, now he's going to enter, uh, you know, Jannah by seeing this dream, then no. But inshallah, if a person sees a pious dream like this, that he saw the Prophet or he saw, you know, Abu Bakr or Umar or a pious, you know, alim in a dream, then uh, inshallah, we hope good for him for this dream. You know. What if you know people who insist on swearing upon their husband and kids as they are much older than you? Is it sufficient to say, Adhu Billah min shaitan al rajim when you hear kufr and you can't change it? Even if they're older than you, you should say, you know, uh, uh, whatever, auntie, uncle, however you address them. Do you know that the Prophet them said that whoever, uh, no, you should show respect. You should, uh, whoever uh, swears by other than Allah has committed a type of kufr or shirk, you know. So you should still try to advise them. And if they, you know, persistently refuse, then it's a different story. But initially, definitely, many people are doing it out of ignorance, you know. Show them the hadith. I mean, clearly, open up the book. It's right in front of you, you know. It's a clear, explicit hadith. Do not swear by other than Allah. Okay, what are they going to say? No, I don't want to believe this hadith. I mean, you know, it's a clear, explicit hadith, and inshallah, they would accept your advice. Inshallah, you know, before you get to that stage, inshallah, they would accept your advice. If we can have titles like judge of judges, how can we give in yesterday's lecture of classifying classifying narrators in the tadil? We said number one, highest level of praise we can say imam of imams or most trustworthy, giving them titles like this. Is this wrong? I know we give them this title understanding that it is only men, but is it wrong? Uh, imam of imams is not the title of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam is a human thing. Imam is a leader of humans. Okay? So it's not a title of Allah. Most trustworthy, Allah doesn't even have, you know, a title most trustworthy. It's without saying, without saying, without, it goes without saying Allah is the most, you know, uh, trustworthy. In the sense, Allah says in the Quran, وَمَنْ أَصْدَقُ مِنَ اللَّهِ قِيلًا Who is there that is more trustworthy or more truthful than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So there is no comparison or competition. Whereas the judge of judges or the king of kings, now we are getting to shirk. Why? Because Allah is the judge of judges and Allah is the king of kings. But when we say that he is the, you know, the hafiz of this world, right? the half of, of our times, the, the scholar of our times, this is clearly human. It's, it's of the highest category of humans in the sense we praise him so much, but there is no shirk involved here, okay? So you see the difference, right? The imam, imam by its very, what does the imam mean? Imam means the leader of, of, of the humans or whatever, you know? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of his names and attributes is not imam. You know, this is something that is human. So there is no, uh, there is no contradiction, or there is nothing that goes against Allah's attributes when we say imam of imams. Really, this goes back to the meaning of what you're talking about. If there is some type of, uh, you know, uh, divinity involved, like the judge of judges or the king of kings, then this is prohibited. If there is no divinity involved, you know, like the imam of the muhaddithin, right? There is no, it's clear this is a human guy, imam of the muhaddithin, you know, or the half of, of, of our times. This is a clear, it's a human thing. So in that case, it's alright to, to name something like this. Now, when we suffer in this world, physically, emotionally, or financially, does that mean we suffer in the hereafter? We went over this yesterday. We went over the king that uh, we went over this yesterday that it uh, doesn't necessarily mean that. And in fact, a person when he suffers in this world, he should, inshallah, have the best presumption, the fish and of Allah, that he, that these are uh, his sins being brought forth in this world, so, so that on the day of judgment he will not have any sins. He should have a fish and and he should be patient, and he should expect to receive reward from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. How about the verse? Yeah, the first part of the question doesn't, uh, perhaps the wording isn't correct. When we ask for forgiveness and if we're forgiven, or if we do a bad deed and do a good deed to repent, then will we still be punished in the hereafter? If you ask for forgiveness sincerely, 
and you fulfill the conditions of repentance, then you will not be punished in the hereafter. The condition for repentance, we went over them a number of times. Who can remember them? The first condition for repentance is? No. Repentance is Toba. <laughs> Sincerity. Sincerity, that you really, sincerely want to repent for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? The second condition of repentance is? To feel guilty. And nada mutawba. The person said to feel guilty is a part of tawbah. Okay? The third condition of repentance is you actually physically ask Allah, Astaghfirullah, you know, Allah forgive me. You physically, uh, you say Astaghfirullah in other words that uh, ask Allah's forgiveness. Okay? The fourth, uh, the fourth condition is that you make a sincere intention that you will not return to that sin. Okay? And that intention must be sincere. You make a sincere intention to return to, to not to return to that sin. Because obviously if you know you're going to return to it, then there's a type of, you know, not full repentance involved here. The fifth condition is that, oh, where is it now? What was the first one? Oh, this increases your good deeds, the fifth condition. That you have realized that you have done some wrong, so this will automatically cause you to increase your good deeds. Okay? And the final condition is that if you have done a wrong to a fellow human being, then you go and return that wrong to, for example, you stole some money, you return the money. You backbite it, you go and ask him his forgiveness. Okay? This is the sixth condition of tawbah. And if you do these uh, conditions, inshallah, you will be forgiven, inshallah ta'ala, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says so in the Quran and the Prophet says so in the Sunnah. That whoever repents sincerely, he will be uh, forgiven. Let him find out, yeah. You spoke about things that didn't have souls and how we can draw nature, but I thought everything worships Allah and there is a hadith about a tree that cried because the Prophet did not visit it, visit it. So does that mean we cannot draw trees? No, you can draw trees because trees don't have the souls that we know it okay Allah knows how they have their life Allah knows how they Abdurrahman trees speak but people shouldn't speak in classes okay <laughs> trees do have life okay but the type of life that Allah has given them is not a life with a soul okay only animals and humans and jinns they have souls okay so anything that has a soul that is what is permitted to draw, to draw. when a man came to Ibn Abbas and he said he is an artist okay he draws for a living Ibn Abbas said, I am only telling you what I heard from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet said that the worst people on the Day of Judgment will be those who draw images. So the man became very frightened and scared. So Ibn Abbas, and he said, this is my only means of living. So Ibn Abbas said, if you must, then draw things that don't have souls in them. Mountains and trees and rivers. This is what he said. Roughly to this effect, you know. So he said that it's okay to draw things that don't have souls in them. And he mentioned, uh, you know, trees and plants. Okay. So plants, they are alive. And in fact, everything has, has been given a type of life by Allah. But of course, from our physical world, mountains are not living. Okay? Walls are not living. But in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they still do praise Allah. How? We don't know. But we're talking about life here. You're never going to kill a mountain. You know? They don't have a life that you can take away. Whereas a tree, it has been given a life without a soul. And animals and, and men and jinn, they have been given lives with souls. So we're not allowed to draw those objects that have souls. That's, that, that is what I said. No. This is in regards to the fiqh class. If the time of Fajr is ending and your husband is still not ready to pray, is it better to pray or wait for him and pray Jama as long as you don't miss prayer time? If you don't miss the prayer timing, do Jama, it's fine. But if you think you're going to miss the prayer timing, then uh, uh, pray. But as long as you know that it's, you're going to catch the Jama before the, the timing, then it's better to wait for the Jama. Yeah.